ceiling was shattered. All excuses were shattered, destroyed in terms of minority aspirations. The White House symbolizes in this nation uh, like the last carrot being chased that was caught. That uh, human aspiration is unlimited. The headline of the New York Times the next morning after his election read, the great barrier of race falls. Now, many, black and white, felt they would not live to see that because this nation did not have a truth and reconciliation conversation as they did in South Africa proposed by Nelson Mandela and led by Desmond Tutu. And so, 40 years, and in the black community that is deeply religious or spiritual, the very number 40 had biblical significance. 40 years after Martin King passed, this event happened. And many minority people in this country felt that since um, there had been no race dialogue, except in isolated ways, attempted by William Jefferson Clinton and by a governor here and there like uh, Sonny Perdue of Georgia, it was felt since nothing like that occurred that whites had not done any self-searching introspection to try to come to terms honestly with the truth of the white oppression of black people. And so it was a double shock uh, that Barack did as well as he did in the very long, the longest campaign in the history of the nation. And even though we were all impressed with him and thought that he was a fine young man who did a splendid job in Philadelphia in his spontaneous speech on race in response to the Jeremiah Wright situation. Well, it was felt that when they got to Iowa, most black Americans had already decided that though it would be nice to have Barack in the White House, that we were going to have to, the majority were going to go for Hillary in order to win because we really didn't think that black people were numerous enough to elect Obama. And we didn't believe there were enough whites who were ready. And so we thought by going with Hillary, we'd get two Clintons in the White House. That would be a sweet revenge to the Republicans because blacks were always very fond of William Jefferson Clinton in spite of Monica Lewinsky. But an interesting thing happened that nobody expected. In a state with very few, and some say no, elected black politicians, Iowa, Barack won. That was a watershed in black political consciousness. And so, African Americans said, well, maybe we had better reassess this situation. White people have done more homework in private than we ever imagined could happen in 40 years with no big public campaign for a race dialogue. And so that persuaded many blacks between Iowa and New Hampshire, the New Hampshire primary, to shift their sentiments 
toward Barak because we believe that for the first time there were enough votes out there, minority and white, to give him the nomination. Well, you might recall he lost New Hampshire, which enlivened Hillary. But South Carolina was more than a fairy tale, to quote Bill Clinton, who thought it was just a fairy tale. Mm. And so, as he gained momentum, that uh, night in Grant Park achieved what many thought was impossible because many of us are aware of how much of a monolith race is in this country. How much of a monolith is it? I mean, when you see, mm -hmm. every time you have a debate, mm -hmm. this week about Donald Sterling in, in LA, mm -hmm. Tracy Martin, Jordan Davis, um, you know, all the, every time you have a big debate, mm -hmm. it seems to me, being from a foreign country overseas, it turns into race. Why is that? <laughs> well, some things die hard. Martin King made it very clear that he didn't want just to change the laws, but he wanted to change attitudes and hearts and social structures. Well, it's very clear that though the laws have changed, I think perhaps we can say that the social structure work is not done, but many blacks have been elevated to positions of prominence in the top echelon. But The best work has not been done yet on methods for getting people to move even through their spiritual communities toward transformation. But we've been tutored that it goes on, even though it takes some time, it does go on imperceptibly and privately and in a subterranean way. But Dr. King told us many times, there are many white people out there who are just as interested in seeing black people free as they are interested in white freedom. And so this is the reason he was not in favor of separatism just another word for segregation. He was an integrationist. I should add a footnote here. He had strong misgivings as to whether the schools, the public schools, would really integrate because he really believed, as did his great mentor, Benjamin Elijah Mays, the sixth president of Morehouse College, who was president of the Atlanta School Board during desegregation, both men were very concerned that white teachers would not do the necessary retooling to qualify to effectively teach integrated classes, helping minority students understand the minority contribution to the building of this nation. The textbooks are still a near history, near of accuracy regarding the non-white contribution. And this is why it's so important for blacks to also own publishing houses. You see, 
prejudiced. Gets established by the power to institute it. You have to have the finances. And the black stone. Not like the whites. You have to remember it's only been very recently that black companies have made it to the stock market. We just came from, from as I told you, we just came from Gaston, Alabama. Um, and again, being, being from, from, from Denmark, seeing the culture, especially down here in the south, is, is very interesting. We went to see the people at the country club in Gaston. It's, it's a small, fairly typical city, Alabama, I, feel, I guess. Um, they had black people working in the kitchen, in the restaurant. Nobody playing golf on the turf. And a couple miles down the road, you had uh, the black neighborhood, with, where the houses were smaller and the kids were poorer. Is that a, is that a typical picture? I would say so. Yeah. What does it tell you? that golf is a white game. It's for people who can afford leisure. It's sort of comically said that a black game in the United States is basketball, much smaller co area, the court. Mm -hmm. yeah. Golf course, yeah. usually owned by the wealthy, you can afford to buy a lot of real estate and keep it up. That's a lot of grass to cut. Basketball, many people can play. Golf, it's you know, one on one. <laughs> you know, tennis, one on one. But I know that that I know that I know that Dr. King traveled Gaston um, back in the day. Mm -hmm. What would he say? I know you can't answer this precisely, but what would be your best qualified guess as to what would he say were he still alive traveling to Gaston or all these other cities 40 years later? Well, I think he'd be surprised at some of the progress we have made, but after looking more carefully, you know, he'd, he'd say, you know, so far so good, but not far enough and not good enough. He was a moral cosmopolitan. He wanted us to have full access. He wanted a level playing field economically. And he wanted us to be able to achieve at the same pace as everybody else. But he also knew that power concedes nothing without a struggle and that you have to prepare. The fascinating thing is that Barack Obama can stand toe to toe with anybody in the country, academically, professionally, in terms of his personal integrity, social concern, and as a model worth emulating. All of that. And look how the representatives of the Tea Party have treated him. They would rather wreck the whole nation in order to show there is disapproval of him. It's nothing but old-fashioned racism. That's what it is. The Supreme Court's decision to treat corporations as persons so they could have unlimited use of cash. Luckily, it was enough moral fiber, ethical strength in the nation that they made it very clear that the White House cannot be bought. That's deep democracy at work. You say that there's a lot of black people in the top echelon. Um, you have the white no, house. I wouldn't say or that. Or more. Yes, least. more, yes. And, the, the, the and that started, by the way, April 5th, 1968. That's the day after Martin Luther King died. 
driven initially by some white fear, hopefully today by intelligence. Talking about the Tea Party, do you get a sense that it's this, do you get a sense that there's been a reaction to, the, to a black man in the White House uh, in terms of policy? I'm talking about voter ID laws, uh, some of this. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, yes. There's a definite reaction. You have to remember, you have an element in the country of the larger social order who see black people in a stereotypical way. And they have been forced by him winning this office to their shock to recognize him in a respectful way like they recognized the 43 presidents who came before him. Well, there are some people who are determined that he will not rise to the status of a white man in terms of respect. You know, he's got all the perks. Now, he's got Air Force One. <laughs> His address is 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. He's got the beast. <laughs> they play hail to the chief, but they want to deny him political power, legislative power, simply because they are obsessed with a fantasy that defines blackness negatively. It's difficult for some people to adjust to being cooperative with Obama because they see blackness as an ontological evil. Do you understand? Yeah. An ontological evil. Okay? They have demonized him. They have demonized blackness. That, by far, is not the majority of white people. I just don't believe that. But I think there's an element that has become known as the Tea Party that has been able to exercise a method for causing fear, a tremble factor among their political representatives on Capitol Hill. And they're the same people passing voter ID laws. And exactly. Laws, right? And the whole stand your ground laws. They somehow cannot countenance the idea that one day, and not in the distant future, the white man will be a minority in this country. Especially with many people migrating here, immigrating here from the global south. Do you think there's a truth to the notion that Obama had, uh, he's been forced not to be too overly black? Well, I think during his first term, he was very sensitive to how many Republican white politicians wanted to use everything they could to paint him in a corner as being a black president. Of course, you know, that started with their attack on his pastor, Jeremiah Wright. And I don't know that people actually realize that they forced us to elect the 44th president not being a churchman. And this is the country among that group of conservatives who like to refer to this as a Christian nation. It's not true. <laughs> but it's kind of sobering that in order to qualify, he had to drop his church membership. 
That is an interesting spiritual subordination that needs to be looked at a little more closely from a scholarly perspective, mm -hmm. the implications. I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't realize that. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, but I mean, in a, in a political sense, do you think he's been forced to be more careful about his race than former presidents have? Well, I think he has been very careful not to get angry, show his emotions, because that would be exploited. They would want, love to say, you just simply got an angry black man in the White House. So I think he has been very sensitive to that. And I think he has been masterful, deserving the highest honors, if you got honors for this, for not falling into their traps. And I think that uh, it's one of the reasons he waited to his second term to respond to some of the disabuse and oppression of blacks. I think he's been sensitive to that all from the very beginning. But he has been aware of where he was. And he has um, differed a little from his wife. People have joked that she's from the south side of Chicago. <laughs> well, you see, Barack is a unique development on the American scene that I don't believe could have ever happened if he had been reared, born and reared in the continental United States. You ever been to a Hawaii? No. Well, you ought to go sometimes. And I think you'll have a deeper appreciation for who Barack Obama is. It's a very peaceful, serene island. There's a tranquility there that I think matches Obama's personality. But, but his wife, I saw some of the south side of Chicago come out in her personality on the day she'd been invited by a group of prominent uh, Washington, D.C. women um, to give a speech. And someone in the audience, a white woman, jumped up and interrupted her speech and wanted her to address a particular issue. And Michelle Obama walked off of the platform she was standing on into the audience and got right in front of that woman's face and said, basically, I'm the invited guest. You've interrupted me. It's either going to be you talking or me. He said, if it's you, I'm going to leave and give you the mic. Or is it going to be me? Well, she knew that that audience was not going to stand for her walking out of there, which she very well could have with the Secret Service's help, with no problem. And they didn't come to hear that woman who interrupted her. Sure. But the mere tactic she used, the audience supported Michelle and supported that woman taking her seat, went back to the mic. Now, there are a lot of blacks in this country who have wanted Obama to behave the same way. But he knew that Fox News would exploit that to their advantage. And so he hasn't done it. And I think he was wise. So I'm putting, putting, putting a little, someone putting, putting strains in himself. Yes, yes. Highly disciplined. And when Michelle has said, you don't know my husband. I think she's aware of just how disciplined he had to be to become the uh, president of the Harvard Law Review, to publish two books by isolating himself and just doing it. This is a man who has tremendous self-discipline. That's the kind of man you want close to the black box. And that's the kind of guy who got Osama bin Laden. Would you, would you take a shot at what it, what it means to the average black people, for example, uh, here in Atlanta or in Gadsden or Birmingham, Alabama, 
having a black president, what, what are you going to look back at in terms of his legacy? Well, I think the, surely the biggest thing will be Obamacare. Um, I don't know that this statistic is the right number of years, but it seems to me that presidents of the United States have been trying for 75 years to get that through. And the fact that he came along and did it, that's a, an irritation to a lot of his opposition that a black man got it through. And unfortunately, they, that's how they see it racially, that a black president got it through and the other white presidents who tried couldn't do it. They are, many are current, currently incapable of transcending race. But in my opinion, and I may be the first to say this, The historians may write up his history in such a way, what he was up against and what he achieved, that he might very well make his way onto the National Mall with Washington, Lincoln, of course, Jefferson and Roosevelt, and now with King. That's how important it is. Well, no, I'm just, in a sense, I'm saying this is certainly as significant to the Obamacare, this federal health insurance. This might be the most recent thing that has occurred legislatively to match or be potentially comparable to Social Security under Roosevelt. I remember him saying something li along the lines of uh, young black kids having to pull up their pants. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, because so you true know, to that? well yeah, you you know there was a fad in this country uh, of young men uh, walking around with their their jeans or their trousers uh, low enough for you to see the crack in the start of their buttocks. They still do. Some do, but less. And so there was a campaign uh, on TV and in colleges and universities of presidents addressing the issue. You know, it happened here at Morehouse College. And so uh, but, I mean, I heard it sort of uh, like a metaphor as well um, for the black community being responsible for their own fate, fate as well. Yeah, they, you know, the admonitions on the part of many of our leaders was aimed at helping the young people to see that tomorrow is today and today is forever and that the person you will be, you are fast becoming. And so they were encouraged to grow up, pull up your pants and grow up and stop just participating in the current trend. Uh, you know, in every era there's been a new one, swallowing goldfish, seeing how pe many people could be stuffed in a phone booth, mooning. Do you remember mooning? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I remember when I was uh, a teenager in the 1950s, we used to buy Levi's. Uh, the Levi jeans were bought extra tall so that you could take the cuff and then roll it up all the way to your knee. The higher the cuff, the more cool you were. That didn't last more than two years. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, is, is, is there a, a truth to the, what I heard him say basically was not just the, the kids in the street, but also the black community taking responsibility for itself, uh, pulling itself out of the, 
the, I don't know what you say, the dirt or the mud. Yes. Uh, coming yes. together, starting yes. businesses oh, yeah. on all level of, of oh, black yeah. communities. Yeah, but you have to also remember something else. Black youth in this country have also had a desire to be able to live their own unique individuality. They feel that white youth have had that opportunity. For years, black people were told uh, to behave in a sort of cookie cutter fashion in order to lift the race. Because we had to prove that we could do everything whites could do and only do it better. Mm. And so there wasn't a lot of room for individualism to get expressed. But now that the segregation laws are off the books, blacks, youth feel, okay, now I don't have to describe myself simply as being black. I can be a guitar player, <coughs> a dancer, a swimmer, any number of other things. When people ask me to describe myself, I don't have to start by saying, I'm black. There are other ways that are non-racial for characterizing yourself. And these other ways are a more diverse set of virtues. Now you can say you're president as well. Exactly. I talked to several people who say that even though you got rid of segregation and separation, um, in large because of, because of Dr. King, um, you still have some sort of practical, structural segregation in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You find that to be true? Yes, in the church. Dr. King said that the 11 o'clock hour on Sunday morning is still, he said this 40 years ago, and it's still true today, it's still the most segregated hour in the nation. It's How is that? churches have not significantly integrated. Most congregations are black or white. There are exceptions, Joel Osteen, Michael Beckwith, their churches, Culver City, California, Beckwith. But the same is true for streets, right? For streets? Oh yeah, you have black, black, streets, black neighborhoods, black and white communities, okay. but you have integrated communities as well. In Atlanta, uh, African Americans live all over the city. And uh, you have Southwest Atlanta, where they're f practically, I guess, 99% black. Buckhead is probably 98% white. And there, it's a matter of whether you have the money. Buckhead represents the old money of the city. Yeah. That's where the governor's mansion is located. When are you getting rid of that pattern? Well, a lot is being said about that, you know. It's the price of inequality. When do we get rid of it? When blacks have the financial capital to invest purchase large tracts of, of land. Um, there's Mercedes Benz of Buckhead on Piedmont Street. It's owned by a black man. But he didn't get that easily. He had to use every bit of political connection in the city because the white uh, automobile dealers were fighting against him tooth and nail because of that name and that location. He was coming into their community. And he has been able to maintain a first class business, and to my knowledge, is outselling them. That's a good example, but who's keeping the majority back? Well, or what is keeping them back? Certainly the white banks, because if they won't loan you money, uh, then you can't experiment. So I would say the banks, uh, the 
would be my number one institution. Uh, government, you solve, you see what's, you know, it took a long time for the legislation put forth by John Lewis, Congressman John Lewis from Georgia, the legislation for the African American History Museum to be built. You have a Holocaust Museum, you have an Indian Museum, but Jesse Helms for years blocked the legislation. It didn't move until he retired. But he filibustered and saw himself, his calling in life to prevent that blacks from having the respectability of having their history enshrined among the Smithsonian Museums. Why? Because he was born into a culture that said blacks are inferior and they don't deserve to be equal to the white man. There are all kinds of examples of that. I pass that place every time I run. And you don't even think about it? No. Nope. Nope. That's because you're white. Yeah. You see, you have got something that other groups don't have. And unfortunately, if you don't um, speak up and fight, nobody else is going to fight for you. Mm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And this is a concern. You may cut that off now. This is a concern that I have that I have told my staff member, mm -hmm. don't ever let anybody else come in here again and record me without you doing it. And he did it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have a word with him now. Can I ask you to just sit for what we call a little B-roll before you leave? Sit for a B-roll? B-roll.